Hello, everybody. Welcome to a last minute, just impromptu stream of exploring Avatar with my friend Drew from Avatar Sequels. Uh, but yeah, apparently, uh, James Cameron decided to drop, drop some bombs today on like an Entertainment Weekly article. So we're like, hey, we just let's just cover it live. So, so hello to everybody here. Uh, you know, thanks for joining us last minute. But uh, yeah. Uh, Drew, <laughs> did you anticipate like this random article from Entertainment Weekly to drop probably some of the biggest uh, Kiri news ever? Yeah, I didn't anticipate it at all. Not that we were going to get anything else today or the Kiri news. So I was, I was definitely caught off, caught off guard. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's just say hi. We got Aftem Child, Brianna Brown. Hello. Th thank you for joining us. Is this live? Yes, we are live. <clears throat> but all right. Uh, yeah, we're just kind of run. It it's going to be a quick one today, maybe, you know, an hour uh, the latest. But we'll run through an article where James Cameron breaks down four different scenes, and they actually give us new images for each of those. So we got four new images. Some of the stuff we already knew, so we're gonna start from like the least exciting in the way of like it gives us the least new information, and we'll work our way to the fourth one being the Kiri like bombshells that he kind of dropped right there nonchalantly. So we'll save the Kiri inf information for the end to obviously you know kind of go back and forth with you guys to see you know we'll just kind of like discuss it together. But um, yeah, so it's uh, it was this article on Entertainment Weekly earlier today, and we'll start with the uh, the scene of the Tolkun. So it gives us a new picture. I'll bring it up now of you know Loak with Pyakan. So it's this picture here, and that's Loak, and that's the the damaged fin from Pyakan. And we would have seen you would have seen that if if you got that scene as one of the the three possible you know end credit scenes after the Avatar remaster recently, but uh, yeah, so we're gonna read what he had to say describing this uh, what this uh, picture pertains to. So I'll get that right up. And if you want, Drew, like uh, I could read one and then you could read the other. Because there's four of them, so it kind of, you know, two and two, if that works for you. Yeah, sounds good. I'll let you go first, buddy. Yeah. All right, so here's the one describing the Tokun picture. So he says, uh, the first image sees uh, Kiri swimming underwater. Of course, we're going to get to that one at the end. Among all the various forms of sea life, Cameron estimates there are probably 10 or 20 times of what we see here when it comes to total creatures designed for the film. Among the new, it says begins, but I'm assuming maybe beings introduced in the way of water are the Tokun, which appears similar to the whales of Earth. We treat the Tokun as characters, says Cameron. They are slightly transcendent animals that have some degree of consciousness and culture. They're intelligent, highly cultured, highly linguistic. They interact with the ocean Navi as equals. The Tokun also share the same religion as the Metkaina. Typically, Tokun have large petrol wings like a humpback whale, as well as a cephalic fin, like an end fin. This Tokun, however, has seen better days. Two-thirds of its cephalic fin has been blown off, which speaks to the film's wider, war wider warfare. You're actually seeing a damaged, scarred Tokun, Cameron says. You see the scar down across his eye and the scar tissue at the end of the fin where it was amputated. There's a lot going on in that image. You know, as we discuss it, bring the image back up. But we know that this is actually Payakan, right, Drew? Yeah, it is. All right. And, and you know, something that stood out right there was that the Metkayina and the Tolkien share the same religion. I found yeah, that very I, interesting. I'd almost forgotten. I think 
somewhere we had heard that maybe once before because it sounds sort of familiar, but it wasn't something you know they've kept repeating. So that'd be interesting right. to see how that works out. But I wonder if that's the I you know in the we're, we got another picture here the what the scene also one of those three after the remaster where Tonawari talks about the Tokun way. I wonder if that is the name of the religion or if it's something completely, you know, different that we haven't even heard uh, what it's called yet. It's very interesting because I never really thought about the different clans having different religions per se. So I'm kind of excited to see what that is. Yeah, I guess we kind of just assumed that, you know, just like the Ometekaya kind of like it, you know, they just kept referencing Ewa and all that. I guess we just assumed that was kind of like Pandora wide and that's what they would identify as their, you know, uh, religion in a way. But, um, but yeah, that's very interesting. But yeah, this one was the one that gave us the least bit of new information. Um, anything else that kind of, I mean, we do get the confirmation that, you know, his fin was actually blown off, but we kind of assumed that in the scene when we see like a harpoon, you know, I believe on the other side, he has a, he still had like a harpoon um, stuck on it. So, yeah. But yeah. That low act basically, uh, release for him. Yeah. So he got into a confrontation with the RDA. And I wonder if during this conflict is where Tonawari me- uh, mentions, you know, that he killed and which now makes him the outcast. Whereas, like I mentioned before, I think that, you know, they, they, the trailers have been misleading us a little bit. I think it can apply to, like, the Soli children if maybe they're looked at, you know, a little a little different by the other clan. But we do know that Tonawari says outcast to Payakan because he killed because the Tokun way, which, like we said, we don't know if that's the religion, does mention, you know, not to kill no matter the reason. So, yeah. You know, which is very interesting because, I mean, just looking at the damage he sustained, you know, that huge scar on his large eye and then his fin being blown off, the other fin having a harpoon through it, like, man, if that isn't reason to kill, you know, it's, I mean, it, which is interesting because it's, it's he's probably not just like some kind of crazed killer going around killing everybody. It looks like no. probably, you know, we're going to assume he did in self-defense. But even then, that's still breaking this code that they have. I, I found that very interesting. So I wonder if that yeah, ties I, into I, the religion aspect as well. Exactly. I was I, w- I was kind of even wondering, I'm like, was it maybe in defense of Loak? You know, kind of like a predecessor to the scene where we see, you know, Loak wake up on top of Payakan. I, I wonder if like that was preceded it. I know the wounds look like they're not so fresh, but I do know somebody in my comments told me that, you know, underwater, you know, the wounds can quickly look, you know, like they're a little older, you know, instead of just continuously looking, looking fresh, you know, uh, even hours later. So uh, maybe it wasn't defense. That's how they kind of, you know, because he did say he saved my life. It could have been, you know, from an RDA attack or it could have just been like, uh, Loak was out there because we did get that concept art of what looks like Loak on because he has the same armband that he has there on his left arm on that uh, elu where it looks like it's during like a thunderstorm or or some kind of some kind of storm at sea. So he, um, right. I'm in the two camps. Maybe he either def- saved him from RDA or he kind of saved him from like you know maybe just like being out there you know possibly about to drown or something from that storm. That will be interesting um, to see because I'm assuming <clears throat> whichever it is or if it's something else that we haven't even seen yet, I mean, that's going to be what causes this bond between these two. Even at the, you know, even though he might draw the ire of the Metcaina who are helping out his family, he's still going to choose, I believe, this friendship with this, you know, creature that's essentially looked down upon by the Metcaina. So that's, that's going to be an interesting dynamic to see how that all plays out. Yeah. And it's already one of my, like uh, one of the, you know, kind of side plots, probably if you will call it that 
going into the movie is uh to see their you know their bond you know how it forms and basically how it kind of grows throughout this movie and obviously you know we could see it grow even further in the in the other sequels because he did say i believe in the total film which it's it's kind of crazy because it's like just either today or i don't even know what day i'm in i think last night but today because it's a uk magazine uh that total film one came out and he did state that the this ocean setting is not just one that's going to be abandoned after the way of water he actually said it was going to last, like, we're at least going to touch on it throughout all four sequels. So that was the first time I'd actually heard that. I thought maybe just two and three, which is why maybe they were just, you know, logistically shoot those back to back. But, you know, we could touch on it again for, you know, three, uh, four and five as well. I think that's fun because, I mean, we don't know who's going to survive or who's going to fall, but. I love that we're going to get to know some of these characters, but not just for one movie, but possibly for the rest of the franchise. So, I mean, that, that you know, is a real investment. So I'm excited for that. Exactly. And, uh, but yeah, what do you guys think about this image? Anything you guys ha- are able to point out that maybe we haven't? Uh, let us know right now down below. So let's see. Okay, Ty Cox, I think he I think he solved it, man. He said <clears throat> the fin might have be ripped off by a lightsaber. <laughs> oh god, here we go. Last stream we got the the, the MCU creeped in and now in this stream uh Star Wars had to creep in. <clears throat> uh let's see. Uh they worship Awa, but different clans interpret her will different based on their environment and their rules, as well as Awa's three rules. That's actually an interesting way of putting it, because in a way that kind of reflects us here, you know, how, uh, I mean, not to really, you know, get deep into religion or anything, but, you know, one, one culture can kind of see things a little bit, you know, from like this angle over here, and then this one over here a little different, where it might seem like they're they're actually a little different when they're not, when they might be even just talking up. You, you, you understand what I mean? Like it could be the same thing, but just kind of like a whole new, uh, you know, a country or no, a whole new culture can just see, you know, see things a little bit differently, even though you might be talking about the same, the same deity or something like that. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. We see that all the time, you know, with say like, christian faith and there's a bunch of different denominations or you know Mm -hmm. branches Mm -hmm. they may they may vary wildly but they kind of have the same core beliefs yeah exactly yeah that's actually like you know really interesting and i'm wondering like like they said because of also they're based on their environment too i still think you know that tree that we've seen uh heavily referenced you know that underwater tree I, I still think that's where their main connection to Awa is going to be. And maybe they don't even call it Awa, or maybe they do. But, you know, maybe what if they have, a, like, a different, you know what I mean, a different name for it or something like that. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how that works for them. And, like, you know, was that underwater, quote, unquote, what we're calling a tree, you know, was that their tree of souls? Was that just one of them? You know, I'm excited to learn more about that. Exactly. And then we kind of theorize together on one of the last ones that, you know, maybe it's at the site of the, uh, the that cove of the ancestors. We're thinking maybe it's it's down there, uh, uh, down there underneath the water. So, uh, yeah, that'll be re- very interesting because there's also like really cool formations. Like, I know people always like say it's kind of like some space launching uh, thing, but yeah, kind of like those circular uh, uh, elements that you've seen in like the concept art, and even in that first initial uh, teaser shot during the day, kind of looking onto it. <clears throat> but um, Afton Child here says, "I didn't even know he had the scar on his eye." And honestly, I, I, yeah, me too. Like maybe I noticed it when I saw the scene, but I think maybe just trying to take in all kinds of information at once, 
I forgot about the scar on the eye too. So I kind of saw that and I was like, oh yeah, I didn't even really, I knew the fan, but I didn't remember the scar. Uh, did you uh, remember the scar for sure? Or did, did you see I that mean, scene? Yeah, that was the scene I saw and I didn't remember the scar. But okay. Again, like you, I was just taking it all in. It was, <laughs> exactly. it was probably hard to focus on all the details because I was just like mind blown when I was watching it. Exactly. All right, and uh, so we'll go on to do, 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 do. Let's see here. The second one will do them on the banshee. So this was another image we got here. So we have Jake next to Neytiri to his right, and then behind both of them we have Netayam also on a banshee. And I'll bring up the quotes on this one, and you can uh, tackle those for us. Let's see. All right, here's the first part, and I'll bring up the other part once you get to that bottom. What pushes Jake's family out of the rainforest towards the ocean? A bunch of bad S, Cameron says. It begins with the not V parents flying over the floating islands on the backs of banshees along with their eldest son, Nathan. A concerned call from one of their other children sends them back, and from there, the story's on, says the director. Now 15 years older, Jake and Nateri have a different view of life. Becoming a parent changes so much of your behavior and your value system, Cameron says. What we saw in the first film were people who were fearless. Jake would throw himself off his Ekron into a Leonoptrix. Remember those Avatar creatures? But is a father of four going to do that? I'm thinking probably not, because they have a du duty to survive. It doesn't mean he's a coward, but it means his priorities change. Cameron adds that Jake is waging guerrilla warfare against the RDA as he grapples with fatherhood and his past as a warrior. He's trying to keep his kids alive and adjust to his own life, the director says. Is he still a warrior? Are these young boys who are 14, 15, 16 coming up, getting all excited about wanting to go to war and fight for their people and for their land? How's Jake going to be a hypocrite and hold them back when he has to go do it? Cameron may be speaking from personal experience, especially more recently with his younger children with wife, with wife Susie Amos. I've seen the teen years and I've lived through them all, and it can be no fun at all, he remarks. A lot of anxiety, a lot of quests for identity. A lot of trying to be heard and seen. All right. So I'll put the picture back on the screen. And here, too, I believe, you know, a lot of the uh, similar things we've heard from the past. Uh, it it kind of was the, one of the, well, you know, uh, criticisms he had recently towards the MCU was like that they, they all act like college kids and. You know, they act like they don't have any, uh, you know, priorities other than themselves or or families to, you know, maybe think about when they do their things. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be an interesting uh, dynamic, especially because a lot of us, at least, you know, I can include myself in that group. Now, when this sequel comes out, I believe you as well, you know, now we have families. So it, it's going to be relatable for a lot of those, you know, people that were younger at the time and, you know, didn't have families, but now to see the sequel, we can relate to it as well. And then it, it generational as well, where like even younger kids that are barely getting into it. Now they'll have those younger kids to kind of be like, that's their, their entry into this world as us, at least we can maybe even relate to the parent aspect. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think everybody can relate whether you're a parent or whether you're a child yourself. I mean, Mm -hmm. You fill a role and you're going to be able to see one of these or maybe two of these or even more of these characters and be like, hey, I relate to what's going on there. Whether it's the Jake yeah. McCurry role or one of the kids. I think that's really awesome. Great idea. And, and you know, he's he's used it before. You know, you kind of had a uh, sort of this, you know, family dynamic when it came to Terminator 2. You know, that sequel with the whole Arnold and, you know, John Connor. A sort of uh, motherly role with uh, you know Ripley and and the little girl in Aliens, another sequel. So 
it's kind of like in his sequels, you know, bringing that family element though. It's, it's, uh, it's proven to work in the past. So, but yeah, man, I'm excited to see that whole thing, just this whole family. Uh, I'm excited that it's not just, you know, the same two characters, but now we kind of like, we're going to even meet these, you know, four or five other kids and this whole new clan and just how everything, everything goes down is going to be super interesting. I'm really excited. Yeah, and I love this picture because, I mean, like we've talked about before, we're excited to see the Metcaina and, you know, all the new stuff that's going to come with that. But I'm also excited to check out what Jake and Neytiri were doing as they still live in the forest with the Amethikaya clan. Um, it's nice to see Nethiam again because we haven't still haven't seen him a ton, even though we've seen him more now. So I mean, yeah. I love that we actually get to see another photo with him included in it. Exactly. And um, let's see here. Somebody had a good point there. Let's see. Bah, 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 bah. Where was it? I think you would be able to speak to this uh, better than me. They said, uh, Christina says, really hope they don't make Neytiri's new Ekron just look exactly like Seze. That would be such a cop-out. Uh, does it look uh, like very similar? I think they all, I mean, unless they're like a totally different color, I think all of the green and blue ones, I mean, kind of. Look yeah. The same. I mean, that's not yeah, Seze that, right there. That's that's her new one. Yeah, so, no. I mean, yeah. I'm like, yeah, like you said, as long as the base color is like this similar shade, it's kind of hard. Uh, until you get like really, really good shots of you know, for, of the design from overhead or something. I really liked in the little high ground preview where we saw Loak kind of uh, trying to bond with like an orange colored one, and then and, and uh, all that. Yeah, like, that thing was awesome. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like, and even some of the ones that McFarland Toys has come out with. I'm like, we, we need to get some of those. Like where it's not. You're not working on like the same base color, you know. You you change that base color to like a yellow or orange or something crazy, so that they kind of look like drastically different. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll see that down the road, or or once we see the movie, we'll be like, oh yeah, you know, we could easily tell. But yeah, like more changing in the base colors uh, would be would be pretty good. Speaking of yeah, that, I wish they did go. I wish they did create a more different color palette for all of them i think it'd be i think it'd be fun but hey i'll take it <laughs> speaking of that very quickly uh, now that we're talking about banshees and all that uh you i want to get your take on i know it's a separate thing but the total film uh, was talking about quaritch and i even made a recent video about it but the very interesting part was it it confirmed uh, Stephen Lang even confirmed in his quotes that that Quaritch will adapt to the Navi weapons, but also their modes of travel. And he specifically pointed out the Banshees. Like, what's your your take on that? Because for me, it had me like super pumped and super excited. Man, uh, yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be wild to see exactly how far they go with that. Is it just gonna be the Banshees? You know, it didn't sound that way. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Um, so, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, could he uh, end up with a Tolkoon? I mean, that could, you know, there's no time. Oh, the Taruk. The Taruk. <laughs> He's going to go off the Taruk. Man. I know somebody <laughs> that, made, but that, somebody wrote yeah, that in my comments. Uh, somebody wrote that in my comments. They're like, did you... Did you hear that Quaritch is going to get, like, he's going to become Taruk Makto or he's going to get the Taruk? And I'm like, what? <laughs> but now that quote came out and I'm like, that ooh, be... you know, maybe, you know, something exciting like that. And that would be a in very interesting, uh, you know, obviously that that happens and it's, uh, man, it just, it, you know, create a lot of turmoil because the Navi are supposed to, you know, follow whoever is the uh, Taruk Makto. So that would be very interesting, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there type of thing. But just in general, I, I just love that there's confirmation that down the road, 
uh, my biggest takeaway was it's not going to remain like the same note over and over. Like him basically representing the, you know, the uh, human military and, and they're, you know, representing like the natives, like he's going to adapt to that too. So even their battles later on, whether it be towards the end of this movie or just other sequels, they could become very different. So even though they're battling the same character, he's battling with his own inner turmoil and he's adapting to more and more to the Pandoran ways. So just the battles themselves can uh, look very different. Well, and I think that brings up an interesting point because before there hasn't been a ton of RDA fans, understandably. I mean, they're clearly the bad guys. What they stand for isn't good, but I can see it blurring the lines a little bit. Like people might really love Corey and the recoms because in a lot of ways, they kind of resemble the not V, you know, if they're flying on Ekrons and things like that, it might kind of blur exactly. those lines for some fans. Less about the message and more just about the cool factor of what the characters are going to bring. So it'll be interesting to see that play out. And because it kind of, uh, it kind of pointed out, at least my takeaway was that it's not, it's like they, they, they will have the memories but he even said right there, he's 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 gonna he's trying to grapple with like, you know who who is he? What is he? So maybe a lot of these you know recoms are event you know maybe some of them will eventually start questioning that kind of stuff as well. So so it'll probably make sense why maybe some of them could even uh, switch allegiances. But you know we'll 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 get to that when uh, uh when we see the movie. But uh, let's move on to the third one here which was uh, this image of T- Tonawari, Renau, and Aonung. I believe that's how you pronounce I could be completely wrong. I apologize. Uh, the two boys in the Metkaina are the ones I have the most trouble pronouncing, so I apologize if I get it wrong. Um, but, but yeah, this is actually taken from one of those scenes as well. It was uh, the one where he's scolding Soraya and Loak about Loak bonding with Pyakan because Pyakan's an outcast and he kind of explains why, which we've already touched on. But now let's read what Cameron had to say about this one. He says, With the ocean comes the Metkaina, a clan of Navi who dwell in shallow waters. Unlike the Ometikaya clan, whose Navi thrive on land, those in the Metkaina have biologically adapted to aquatic life. They are marked by tails and fin-like strakes that help them propel through the water. Wow. Okay. Cameron didn't want to take the web feet approach. <laughs> like, well, I set myself up for this one. Like just about every other film since 1954's Creature from the Black Lagoon, what the crew created instead was something for the actors performing in tanks of water with motion capture equipment to emulate these strike appendages. We essentially gave them jetpacks, and they were able to trigger the jetpacks themselves on the fly, Cameron reveals. Oh my god, this is nuts. So they'd, cu- so they'd complete a stroke, and when they're in the glide phase of the stroke, they trigger the jetpack with a little tiny switch, and it would push them forward a couple of meters. They'd move their hips like if they had a tail, we called it the crocodile swim. Renal and Tonawari, you know, Kate Winslet and Cliff Curtis, uh, led these Navi, uh, lead these Navi in the, uh, the Metcaina as chieftains. A pregnant Renal is seen in the background of this scene. As Tonawari explains something important about the culture of the Metcaina and the Tokun. Uh, their specific tattoos inspired by Polynesian and Melanesian culture signify their authority. She's the Sahik, the spiritual leader, the shaman, the keeper of wisdom, Cameron says. The male leader, who's called the Olo Ektan, handles the day-to-day, which is hunting, weaving, any kind of fabrication work. He's like the secular leader, and she's the spiritual leader. For major decisions, if it doesn't clearly fall into one camp or the other, but it affects everybody. They need each other's agreement, so even though you see Tonawari as this big, strong, alpha male-type leader... He doesn't make a move without Renato's wisdom. The film suggests Kes met Tonawari before when Navi clan leaders got together sometime in the past 
to discuss the RDA's ravaging of Pandora. Uh, Jake knows him, Cameron confirms, but he's never spent time at Tonawari's village before, so there's a tension between these two guys. They respect each other, but Jake is asking for something that's quite dangerous for Tonawari. Okay. So what are your initial takes away takeaways from all that? Well, from the beginning, the very first thing that really stood out was just the fact that not only did the actors have to learn to hold their breath, but, I mean, they have a switch that helped propel them. Like, <laughs> man, that's, that's a lot. I mean, that, they asked a lot of those guys and girls. I'm tired just hearing about it. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's a lot. So it's like, really, guys, when you watch this, just like, when you're watching these scenes, think not only did they have to hold their breath, or, you know, learn this like sign language because they had to, you know, motion capture that as well. But now this whole other element that we we heard a little bit about in like the pre, uh, I believe we touched they they touched upon it in the preview page of the art book. The, uh, to where I first heard that of the jetpacks, but it's just it's just crazy. Like, can you imagine like having to basically do all these things at once? You got to hold your breath the entire time, holding your breath. But then remembering that, you know, mid glide, you have to hit the button and oh my God. And then, you know, crocodile swim. It's insane. And we're not talking like no name actors. I mean, he got, you know, you've got, I mean, Kate Winslet. Like, she's huge, you know? I mean, he got her to buy in to do all this, to become so good (laughs) at holding her breath. I mean, Sigourney Weaver. Seven minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. I think it's awesome that they all bought in and were able to just master these skills. Because every other movie you watch is just a CGI character, you know? No one actually did the movements. But, man, props to them for doing that because I know it's just going to help it look that much better. Exactly. Like, uh, just the holding of the breath was already, you know, incredible enough. But then just all these other little elements... That, that, that like you said, honestly, like a lot of this could have just, you know, uh, you know, done on the computer. But it's like he wanted the motion, the real motion for everything, even something like that. Just like, you know, move, uh, wiggle your hips, like if you have a tail, like just things like that. It's just, it's crazy, and it's gonna just make me appreciate the movie, honestly, like just so much more watching it. Even though the first one, you know, I already appreciated that so much, and every all the work they put into that, but it's like, man, this seems like two or three times as hard. So, uh, you know, props to all the cast, man, cast and crew. Well, I remember how they made them swim in the first one. There's a quick shot of Jake and Nateri swimming in the water and they put them on an office chair (laughs) and they made swimming (laughs) motions while they mo-capped them. So we've gone from that to this, like, that's just, that's mind blowing. That's crazy. And it's funny because he said uh, also in that Total Film one that the reason we're, we're seeing a Teary not really be comfortable in the water, like, uh, or really come, you know, she's not going to really vibe right, right off the bat with like the whole water element because what he, mm-hmm. he said, what he did was he implemented her actual, like, I don't know if it was fear, but just her not really liking the water or really wanting to do this water stuff just as a person. He I kind of actually implemented that into the character. So when we watch the movie, we're going to see that Neytiri is going to be the one that least like ends up liking the whole water aspect, at least at first. That's interesting. And I mean, I like that he kind of played off of how she actually felt about it too. I mean, that just helps bring the character to life even more. Exactly. You don't get any more authentic than that. And the other thing that really stood out to me is I love how he has made it so this culture and not just the Metcaina, but not the in general, you have the clan leader who isn't always, but is male in this instance. And then you have the Sahik who is female and, I just love that they both play a huge role in making big decisions for the clan. Big it's decisions. not just yeah. Tonawari deciding everything because he's the leader. You know, Ronal has 
just as much say. It might be a different type, but it takes both of them. Love that. Exactly. And I love that just, just looking at him here, um, I love that we already know so much of what he's wearing, what the tattoos already represent. Just from that one two-page spread from the uh, the visual dictionary, it, we, we know he's rocking the like Akula, Akula teeth, um, you know, necklace thing going on there. His little uh, sash thing is like what what they get when they, you know, go through their version of the Ikni Maya. We know what the tattoos mean. It's already cool. Like, like I love that before, you know, back then when I was younger with the Star Wars movies, getting those DK books and kind of like that when you rewatch the movie. And stuff, uh, for me, at least, it was kind of exciting knowing like, oh, I, I know this, you know, the lore behind that little element or that one, you know what I mean? Even though if it, it, you know, in the movie, it might not be that important, but I like that little, that little lore just to know it. Yeah, I do too, because so much of that planning goes into it, you know, and and when we get a book like that, it helps us know those little details and just appreciate the world more. It adds so much depth to what we're seeing instead of just like, Oh, that looks cool. Well, we know exactly why he's wearing it, you know, but I mean, exactly exactly what they are. Like you mentioned the teeth, like, otherwise it just looks like some really cool rocks to me. I mean, I didn't know that was actually teeth. Um, Yeah. Right. (laughs) there's There's so much to it though. I can't wait to get that book. Man. And just so much to the, even the actual movie itself that I I remember. And and I believe just our last one, uh, when we were talking about the trailer where people pointed out, there's so much, you know, that we know is in there that we just haven't even seen play out in trailers or like little TV spots yet. Um, so that and that's even great. I love that they're holding back so much, you know, because honestly, we haven't even seen the Akula besides like a McFarlane toy. You know what I mean? To know that it, it kind of right. more lo- looks like more like the, you know, their version of probably like a, a great white shark or something. So so that's cool, um, and especially all the RDA stuff and everything. But uh, yeah, I love that there's still so much, too, that we just haven't seen. So I'm excited for all that. But I think this takes us to, you know, everybody here probably wants to know or probably already knows, but let's discuss it together. But we'll have Drew read it first. But first, let's look at the picture. Uh, and that's the whole uh, Kiri scene that he breaks down. But here's the picture first. And it's more of, you know, the when the kids are in the ocean. But actually, let's actually go to what he says about this. So I'll bring that up for you. Here's the first part. Here we see, essentially, fish out of water characters, says Cameron. Or as we like to call it the, in the writing room, the unfish in water. Kiri is one of the unfish in water characters. Sigourney Weaver, in a brand new role after appearing as Dr. Grace Augustine in Avatar, plays Kiri, Jake and Natiri's adopted 15-year-old daughter, seen here taking her first swim in the Pandoran waters. The origins of Kiri are complicated. She is a naturally conceived Na'vi raised in the rainforest. It's just that she's born of Grace's Avatar, Cameron explains. It's a natural birth, but the Avatar is brain dead. But she's not. She's normal. Kiri is going through some emotional stuff. By the time she's seen swimming underwater, Cameron points out, it's a scene in which all the kids in the Soli family, including Netiam, Loak, Tuk, and the adopted human child spider, jump into the ocean for the first time and experience the wonder. For Kiri, she goes from this anxious and depressed state to one that's joyful and reconnected over the course of a three-minute scene, Cameron says. Kiri's joy is enhanced from this moment more so than her siblings. She's a character who's a true sensitive, Cameron adds. She's a person who's very connected to the world around them, far beyond a normal not be, to the animals, to the plants, and to the rhythm and balance of life. When she jumps into the ocean, she has this transformative experience. Okay. All right. So there's like, 10 points 
just there's, in there's like a lot feet. there. <laughs> there is so much there, and and guys, this was the 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 description, you know, of a scene or whatever you uh, you say that actually made us be like, okay, we we gotta just impromptu, just last minute, we gotta set this stream up. We gotta we gotta just talk to people. Like like what? <laughs> Everybody had been theorizing for so long. And okay, so just of it is at, at least you know you can correct me uh, afterwards if I'm wrong or if you have a different takeaway, but and, and then people in the chat as well, you know, dive in. Uh no pun intended. Uh basically Grace's avatar body gave birth to Kiri. They preserved Grace, yet the av- her av- Grace's avatar body is brain dead. But Kiri's not. She's normal. And she was nat- uh, naturally conceived. So that means uh, there is a father, or was a the, So somebody's the father. So she's not a reincarnation of Grace. She's literally Grace's biological daughter am i am i is is that your takeaway too yeah it is and i think it's interesting that he spelled it out for us and it's it's nothing really crazy it's nothing that's like unheard of (laughs) yeah i thought i mean i thought we might go until the last one not fully understanding kiri so the fact that he just laid it all out here it is here's what she is like really blew my mind first of all um i thought it was interesting that he called her not v um to me that kind of implies that it wasn't maybe grace and another avatar that are the parents like maybe grace and on an, a not v um versus two avatars and I also thought it was yeah. kind of interesting that he used the word that, you know, her avatar is brain dead. Because really, I mean, any avatar that's not connected via link to the driver is brain dead. So I thought that was just kind of funny that he called her brain dead. But also goes to show, <laughs> I'm mean, going to assume that they kept her avatar body after the failed transfer through AWA and I don't know, at some point, or maybe someone knew that she was pregnant already. It's kind of interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how that played out exactly. Yeah. And just a uh, very quick, uh, Christina Garcia here says, thinking Grace's avatar being pregnant at the Tree of Souls, Kiri's stripes look exactly like Grace's, and they're supposed to be unique, like fingerprints. Kind of hints there was no father. See, in my mind, like, would right away go there. But, I mean, he did state naturally conceived, right? I mean, that implies that there was. Because if not, it would be an immaculate conception like Jesus, right? Right. And her stripes aren't exactly like Grace's. They are very similar. And that uh, diamond on her forehead is very, very much like Grace's, but her stripes are not identical. Yeah, so like 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 that with like like a lot of people, like I would first go to like, oh okay, so then that means you know maybe AWA kind of in a weird way, you know, just impregnated Grace's avatar body or something. But I mean he did state, you know, like you said, the a keyword there like Navi and uh, naturally conceived, so it wasn't some kind of Im- immaculate concept uh, conception or whatever you call it. Um, yeah, if we yeah, take his words at face value, I mean, we have to assume that Awa is not the father, and I'm, I don't have. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any reason not to take his words at face value. He was, he really laid it out pretty clear there. <laughs> yeah, it's like he already laid out like. All the other ninety nine percent of it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's the only aspect that we still don't know is who the father would be. But you know, there is still, I still believe there's something of Awa in her because he still does state that she is special. She's more connected to 
to the world and to the creatures than any other normal Navi. So there is something still special about her. She just wasn't like, you know, not like Jesus. Because I have been saying over and over, I believe she's going to be like Pandora's Saya, kind of like Jesus. But I guess he just, you know, just wasn't an immaculate conception like that. He's saying naturally conceive. So I don't think it's like what, I think it's Loak in the scene. Obviously, we haven't seen it, but we just got the the audio from D twenty three. But I believe it's it's Loak that jokes. You know, like what if Norm is your father? You know, they were around each other all the time, things like that. But I don't think so. But uh, yeah, well, I crazy. Think it's man. Interesting that he that he said that she's connected. You know to the world far beyond a normal not V because look how much the not V are connected to their world. You know, they, they care about every aspect of their world, the animals, the creatures, everything, the uh, plants, you know, but she's far beyond that. So, I mean, that's, that's a very, very connected right there in itself. And I'm sure there's a reason behind that. So it's going to be interesting how they, how they play that up or if we find out who the father is or, gonna be interesting i wonder if it's just gonna be i I, kind of like uh taking something from that project 880 if you remember because uh i mean i just covered it recently but it's already some of it with with with, with learning so much new info about these like you know info gets freaking scattered but i believe in project 880 wasn't she involved with a actual navi guide like their navi guide I'll be honest, I don't remember. I haven't read that in so many years. So he could take something like that where, you know, when they finally do explain it, it could be like, you know, maybe it was this, you know, random Joe, you know, <laughs> obviously not crab suit driver, but pretty, 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 cro- pretty <laughs> not close. Not that random. <laughs> crab suit. <laughs> oh, crab suit driver. I'm so sorry. He's like, why you got to put me in every situation, bro? What did I do? Just put me in the dang crab suit, man. Close the hatch. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, man, pretty crazy. I didn't really think this would come. Not even in like a cover story to the magazine, which was Total Film, which honestly did not have any of this juicy information, at least when it came to Kiri. Um, so just on like some random entertainment weekly, you know, James Cameron breaks down four, four scenes. It's like, okay. And basically you get like the bombshell, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, this is, you know, her origins. I thought we would have to wait up, up until the movie, you know, seeing it to really get some of these things confirmed, but Hey, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is. This alone is one of the juiciest details I think we've gotten before the movies come out. And it's like, I don't feel like it's getting the proper amount of hype (laughs) uh, just to be thrown in this random article with him breaking down four photos because there's so much more there than just talking about a photo. Because, I mean, Kiri is is very popular amongst people because everybody knows she's special and all the theories going on around her. I'm just really surprised that he shared this with us but hey i'm not mad i think it's i think it's cool yeah because i believe i believe the true juiciest mr like the answers to the mysteries with her are yet to come and it's maybe right. you know it's like what truly does make her special if her if her actual conception was not the special part, because because that's that's what we thought. We thought the actual conception itself was like that was gonna be the you know oh you know conceived through a or, or or something crazy. That's why there were so many theories. And he's like, no, this is this is the you know, the boring part. Like this is the natural. Like that just naturally happened. But the interesting part is yet to come, and you know, obviously he didn't reveal that. He just said she's special. He didn't say why she's special. So, so Awa, I believe, still has a part to play somehow with Kiri. But it, I mean, it seems like she already knew this from like when they were in the forest. But she, uh, 
like the trailer confirms, he doesn't really start opening up, at least to Jake about it, it seems, until they're in the Metcaina because she's they're right there, you know, her feet are in the water, and he's the creatures like on her feet but if you look closely like they're not swimming around his feet you know what i mean <laughs> so right. she really is like super connected you know and that's why maybe even here in, the, in the, this very picture you know so many creatures probably just swimming around her so so i believe the 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 most interesting things with her are yet to come and actually he the very last line he said that as soon as she dived in here you know, it was like a transformative experience for her. And all that does uh, for me is bring me back to that 2014 interview with Sigourney Weaver, where she said, my character is going to transform just because it was a similar word uh, throughout the sequel. She's going to she's going to have transformations. So, you know, maybe this was just the start of something, you know, awakening uh, within her that we'll see you know, transform or evolve as we go on. So it was just a similar wording that kind of made me, uh, you know, think about that quote. Well, it's not something that I thought about a lot, but I always just assumed that they took her avatar body and her human body and buried them together. So. It's oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. They kept it, you know, they kept her at least. Yeah. I'm assuming they buried her human body but they kept her avatar and i'm curious <laughs> why number one but you know maybe someone had a hunch she was pregnant maybe not i think somebody i think somebody spoke up and said wait 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 i uh you know <laughs> i i think she might she might be pregnant why uh, we might have you know we might have done something uh so you might want to check it out i'm just saying you know I, somebody had to have spoken up, bro. Some, so, you know, they're about to start, you know, piling, you know, piling the deck. We got the little wood sprites in there, Idola, and they're like, oh my God. And he's like, wait, just hold on. I think my child is there. So, as weird as that is, <laughs> that is, that is strange. But, but interesting. And like you said, I'm, I'm just excited that. Yeah, okay, maybe the actual act of conception isn't that special, but she's still special. We're still going to go on a journey with her. We're still going to Yeah. Yeah, she's still yeah, she's still going to be special. Uh we had Chill Zones here ask, does anyone else like the RDA? Um yes. Uh not that I uh, like like the RDA, but especially with these sequels, I love that uh, because the new purpose of them coming is actually like because Earth is dying. I've mentioned in past streams, there's going to be a lot of innocent people as part of this fight. So not everybody's going to be on board with them. So I can't say I completely hate the RDA. Plus, I mean, come on, like the, the, the amp suit, the vehicles are cool. So we, we might not like the initial, you know, purpose in the first movie, obviously, and in the second one. But I believe with these sequels, it's going to evolve. And I hope, you know, the, the, the voice of the people that disagree with it in the end, I hope it gets louder and louder and is the voice that wins um, to basically stop the way they're trying to go about it. And then we could eventually, you know, after the fifth movie come to like that mutual understanding, and you know, coexisting between the Navi and the humans that we know is going to happen, you know, years and years later. So, Uh, but yeah, man, uh, that is pretty much it, guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, George, uh, Georgia writes, what do we think about the relationship between Loak and Soraya? I think it's going to be, you know, as it goes on, I think it's already hinted at that it's going to be as important, maybe, as Jake and Neytiri. Um, You even see the similar posters. You know, they're mirroring the original official poster with this new official poster. 
and the two heads in the original were Jake and Neytiri, but now you have Jake and Neytiri's head and the Loak and Soraya. So I think that's a clear hint that it's going to be a, you know, a big, uh, the next the big relationship in the, in the overall saga. But, but all right, guys, it was just a quick stream to kind of go over this with you guys. You know, I appreciate everybody that tuned in and it's craziness, but tomorrow is where we had our actual next planned live stream. Tomorrow we're going to dive into that first half of the High Ground comic. And if this one revealed a lot of the origins on Kiri here, if you want to know basically spiders also just origin and and all of your questions answered basically on spider then you'll want to tune in to tomorrow's stream where we're going to go through that first half of volume one to the high ground i hope a lot of you have gotten i hope a lot of you have been able to grab that that comic uh let us know have you guys been able to find it in uh in your comic shops or have you called any uh if you haven't yet you can uh, call them and they'll order it for you. It might take like around, you know, about a week or so. Uh, so tomorrow it'll be at 8 p.m. Pacific time, I believe. But I'll have the, you know, once we set it up, it'll be here on the channel. You'll see it. There'll be a countdown to when it starts. It'll tell you the time and everything. But um, yeah, that'll be tomorrow. Uh, oh, Drew's back. <laughs> hey, uh, you good, Drew? I, uh, yeah, we're having some storms here, and I lost the internet, so I uh, I joined on my phone. So okay, all right. Oh, darn, and he's gone again. But yeah, so Drew's having some problems right now. Uh, I guess it's storming over there. Hopefully, everything's okay. But yes, it'll be in the night. It's only because that's when it's uh, most convenient for me and Drew to stream, uh, you know, after work and everything. So it'll be tomorrow night at, should be like I said, 8 p.m. Pacific time. But I'll I'll have it up soon and on the channel. And so if you have the notifications on, you'll be notified. And you can just hit waiting on the video when it comes up. Or you can hit to be notified. And that way uh, you'll be reminded when we go live for that one but yeah so if you guys haven't grabbed your copy yet or if you haven't been able to get one or there are no comic shops around you definitely tune in tomorrow for that one because that also had some really good stuff there was some interesting stuff with kiri in that but obviously not to the extent that you know this one went to where he basically laid out her or but yeah, tomorrow uh it's spider's origin mother father yeah, so like, you know, biological mother, biological father revealed. So, yeah, come back for that one. We're going to go panel by panel, so I'm, we're not going to skip anything, but it's why we're breaking it up into two parts. You know, the, uh, tomorrow it'll be the first half of the volume one, which is going to be like 40 or so pages. And then the following stream, I believe the next Friday, will be the second half. And honestly, guys, it's kind of be – mainly high ground screen uh streams sorry because just like two weeks after we finish the the volume one like recapping that one volume two is coming out in comic shops on november 30th where if for any other major retailer if you guys are waiting it's like december 3rd uh december 7th i forgot but it's in december they have the major retailers releasing them one week right after another, like with the third volume coming out after the way of water even releases. I think it's December 20th for the third volume. So if you want to know all the information of the high ground and, you know, go through it panel by panel with us, uh, check our live streams. We'll keep letting you guys know that way you going into the way of water. You already know the entire, high ground story you know where he even recently talked about it was the what the original movie he had planned and then he just switched he moved it up in the timeline and now we got the way of water um but yeah so if you're if you're interested in navi in space and then information obviously like i said on spider and just 
what their lives have been like on the in between, you know, and that that initial battle again with the RDA before we even get to the way of water. Uh, tune in for those. But I appreciate everybody here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's see. Hold on. One final question from Afton Tower. Question: When is November eighteenth? Um, like day of the week. Uh, for me, it's gonna be on a Friday. So, no. Oh, I mean tomorrow is gonna be our initial one for the first half, and then the eighteenth is gonna be the stream for the second half of Volume One, and then it'll be a stream on. To some other topics, maybe some new news that comes out on the 25th, that Friday. And then Friday the 2nd, oh no, Wednesday the 30th, because we're going to cover the first part of Volume 2 on the day it drops, which is Wednesday the 30th. We're going to start doing two streams a week on that final week of November going into the first weekend of December. So it's just going to be uh, pretty hectic going right into the way of water. and even. The Friday, the way of walls out. We're gonna stream here, give our initial first review, like our thoughts on the movie. It's just gonna be, you know, raw thoughts, nothing, you know, too in depth, you know, because obviously we're gonna see see it many times over. So not every little Easter egg or little thing is gonna be, you know, pointed out. But just if you know, if that day, if you guys watch it early in the day or something, if you guys just want to tune in for that one, it'll be cool just kind of talking to each other. And just get our, uh, you know, thoughts on the movie. But yeah, we're going to have, I'll maybe put even like, a, I'll come up with the whole schedule that I'll probably put on the community tab or something so that everybody can know. But yeah, tune in tomorrow, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll see you there for the first half of High Ground Volume 1. So thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in. And this will be us signing out.